Hello, good afternoon uh, from Geneva, Switzerland, headquarters of the World Health Organization. Uh, recently, our uh, advisory group of strategic advisory group of experts has met, have met and uh, made recommendations on when and how Moderna vaccine against COVID-19 should be used. So uh, to address that subject, I am pleased to be joined today uh, by Kate O'Brien, Dr. Kate O'Brien, our Director for Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals, and by Dr. Alejandro Craviotto, uh, who is the, the chair of this strategic advisory group and who is a professor at the National Medical University in Mexico City. Um, good afternoon, Kate, and good morning, Alejandro. Thank you for finding the time to be with me again and to answer questions from our social media viewers about COVID-19 vaccines and in particular about Moderna vaccine today. Happy to be with you. Thank nice you. to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, before I give the floor to you, I would just like to remind our viewers once again how they can ask their questions. So if you're watching us on Twitter, please ask hashtag ask WH use hashtag AskWHO. And if you're watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, please send your questions via comment section. Um, while we are waiting for viewers uh, to step in with their very good questions, um, maybe um, Alejandro and Kate, you can, you can tell us um, what did SAGE decide and what are the recommendations when it comes to Moderna, Moderna vaccine? Great, Alejandro. Do you want to start with what Sage, um, what, what the main Sage findings were? Yes, I'll be I'll be happy to, Kate. Thank you. Um, as we did the last time, uh, Sage, which is uh, the strategic advisory group of expert, uh, experts on immunization that advises the Director General of the WHO on uh, vaccines and immunization, uh, reviewed all the evidence that we have for the safety and efficacy of the vaccine produced by Moderna, MR, uh, mRNA-1273. Um, after the whole uh, working group um, deliberations, uh, they came to SAGE and we have looked at the vaccine and the basic evidence that we have allows us to recommend the administration of two doses 100 micrograms or half a milliliter each with an interval of 28 days between the two doses. We know that there has been um, a request by many countries to extend this uh, interval. And what we can see from the data that allows us to make a recommendation based on evidence, we say that it can be extended to a maximum of 42 days. So if you don't get your second dose on the 28th day, then you can go all the way to 42 days to get your second dose. Um, the other thing is that the vaccine, as uh, other mRNA vaccines, needs to be administered in a place that has the capacity of treating anaphylaxis if it happens. That means that the place and the people who are given the vaccine should be well trained in this, in this effort. Um, in the case of groups that we still don't have enough information, but would need to make a recommendation, the two important ones. One is the use of this vaccine in pregnant women, for which studies are only started now that will allow us to have full data and complete recommendations. But for now, we have made it clear that any woman who's at risk of contracting COVID because of her work or because she has other illnesses associated with a COVID problem that might put her at risk of having a severe problem, should be offered the vaccine, and then the vaccine should be given in conjunction with the recommendations of the, their health advisors. In the case of lactate in women, it would be the same way. We don't feel that the vaccine so far shown has any impact in the sense of producing problems in either the women who are breastfeeding or the children, but we don't have the evidence so far to be able to um, assess that this is something that can be done effectively. Still, if a woman is a health worker or belongs to one of the high risk groups and is breastfeeding a child, then she can be vaccinated and the child can be maintained at the breast. In the sense of other recommendations, we go again 
to the idea that this vaccine should be given whether a person has had COVID infection or not. So people who have had symptomatic or asymptomatic infections should be vaccinated as well as people who have not been exposed to the virus. And in the other side, we do recommend that the vaccination is given according to our um, priority map in which we uh, insist that this uh, product should be made available first to groups that are highly affected or those who face health inequities. The vaccine is not recommended for international travelers for now because that would increase the problem of equity and there's no reason to think that this is a, a, an issue that can be solved now. There is a recent uh, evidence, uh, there's a recent recommendation set out by the International Health Regulations Group that is clearly stated that there's no recommendation to vaccinate international travelers at this moment. And we suggest that anybody who's interested in details uh, goes to the webpage of the IHR to look specifically at this type of, of issues. I would leave it there and see if there are any questions or if Kate wants to add something to this. Kate, do you have anything to add? No, I think we're happy to go to questions. I think that's um, probably the important thing is people have a lot of questions and we'd love to address them. Thank you, Kate. Um, before I take some questions, I think there is an important thing to clarify. Um, Moderna vaccine hasn't been granted by WHO emergency use listing yet, but the SAGE provided its recommendation. So can you please explain how come in this particular situation we have SAGE recommendations on how to use the vaccine before the product itself has been approved by WHO? Yeah, I sure can. So there are two processes in WHO. One has to do with the the regulatory assessment of the vaccine and the other has to do with the policies for how to use a vaccine. And uh, um, the regulatory side of WHO is in the process um, of, um, of assessing the Moderna vaccine. On the policy side for SAGE, um, we um, review any product that has either WHO emergency use listing, again, this is under assessment by WHO, or a product that has authorization by a stringent regulatory authority. And there's a list of uh, uh, regulatory authorities that WHO has on its website of what are considered the stringent regulatory authorities. And so um, the Moderna vaccine does have authorization by um, at least one, uh, it has actually more than one stringent regulatory authority. And so that put it in the category of vaccines that SAGE would review. The review for the early use listing, uh, for emergency use listing by WHO, the regulatory side is, is underway. And um, there is a full list of by product, what stage that assessment is at on the WHO website. And we're expecting based on that timeline that there will be um, a determination um, by um, at the latest, the, the end of February. Thank you so much, Kate. We have a question already coming from our LinkedIn viewer. What specific data are you referring to to make these recommendations? A subset of participants in the current clinical trial and for how long have they been monitored? Alejandro, do you wanna take the, the question around the data? Uh, <clears throat> as due to the need to have these vaccines available, we have been doing something that we normally uh, do not do. Uh, it, SAGE looks at the evidence that comes out after all the clinical trials have been conducted and finished. But in this case, we cannot wait that long. We need these vaccines to be able to go back to a normal life, to recover our economic uh, situations and to make people uh, stop dying. So in this sense, what we have done is that the companies have looked at one specific area that we want to stop, which is people dying from COVID-19 infection. So in that sense, uh, the data that the companies have supplied is sufficient enough in the sense of safety of the vaccine and efficacy for the control of severe infection in the sense of dying or having severe disease. And those evidences that have been shown 
both to the WHO to have an EUL approval, to the national to the international regulatory authorities for authorization of use in different countries, and for SAGE are sufficient for us to make a decision that the vaccines are safe and that they can be used in the age group that has been recommended. That means for this vaccine for people who are 18 years and older. Um, I don't know if that answers the question in that sense or Kate wants to add something else. Yeah, I think what's important for people to know is that we reviewed the data from all of the clinical trials um, that Moderna has, uh, uh, has stood up. Uh, there are over 30,000 people who are in their growth phase of the clinical trial. Um, and uh, we reviewed the data that were available um, from that trial um, that have also been published um, publicly um, on the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine. And we reviewed the data on um, the immune response um, of this uh, vaccine in, in people of a variety of different ages. Um, so the entirety of the portfolio, the entirety of the data that Moderna has on um, the safety, the efficacy of this product um, was reviewed by SAGE, along with other information that we review on the, um, the disease, uh, on the epidemiology, um, and uh, on, on uh, what, what is the best way to actually use um, this vaccine and other vaccines. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, here is a question, actually comment and question from Carolyn, who is one of the frontline COVID-19 nurses. And she says, I just received Moderna vaccine second dose. Uh, will it be effective for the new variant? So maybe I can take that one. Um, uh, yes. There are, as, as I think everybody knows, viruses are, um, they're a pathogen, they're a germ that does um, change over time. There are mutations um, in viral pathogens on a regular basis, so changes in their genetic makeup. Um, and we've had many different variants of the coronavirus through the course of this pandemic. Um, variants in and of themselves are not news. Um, the, the question is, are any of the changes in a virus doing anything to the virus to make it either more or less infectious and more or less um, likely to cause disease or disease of, of a, a given severity? So there's been very much in the news recently about um, variants that seem to be more transmissible from one person to the next. Um, and in particular parts of the world, the UK, South Africa, Brazil, a number of different places, um, uh, a lot of these kinds of variants are in circulation. The question about whether these variants are gonna be any less likely um, to be affected by uh, the protective effects of the vaccines um, is something we're really interested in. Um, and we're watching very carefully um, the evidence that is starting to come out, the scientific evidence. First evidence from studies that are in the laboratory, and we're waiting for the evidence from the actual use of the vaccines in settings where the variants are circulating. From the laboratory studies where people take the blood of um, people who have already been vaccinated, and so in that blood, of course, are the antibodies that were induced by the vaccine, that, that is tested against these variants. And there have been some very small studies that have been done. Some of the variants, it looks like there's absolutely no effect of that variant on the vaccine. Um, some of the variants, there's a little bit of concern about um, the, the, uh, the ability of the antibodies to still protect against the variant. But all of the studies so far are showing that the amount of antibody um, that is normally produced um, by the vaccines is still above the level that would um, manage to, to protect against the variant. So this is an area we're concerned about, um, but uh, to date, um, we don't have any evidence to expect that the vaccines would be less effective at this point. Thank you so much, Kate. Here's the next question from Victoria Wackerham, watching us from on Facebook. What information do you have on vaccinating teens? Is it safe for them? In the case of people below 18 years of age, the studies have not been conducted, so we cannot recommend the vaccine for them yet. Uh, the, the, the data that the, um, or the prospects for data that the company showed us in the working group clearly state that they will be doing studies first lowering the age to 12 years so that they can go from 18 
to 12. And then, of course, they would need to go into pediatric studies, which require first to look at the doses of the vaccine that can be used in those age groups and then define how they're going to be tested in that sense to go all the way down to infants. This is very important because in the long run, we might need to vaccinate the children against this problem, not the adults. We're doing the adults now because of the pandemic situation, but not in the long run how we would deal with any vaccine or any problem that we have um, in, in this sense. So uh, as long as we don't have that information, we cannot do it. The only benefit that we have seen, and as Kate was saying, reviewing the epidemiology, is that the infection in these younger groups seems to be less severe if it happens. And then the transmissibility in small children, which have always thought to be a, a case of where the, vaccine, where the virus could be spread easily in schools and other places, hasn't been shown. The, the small children do not seem to be high transmitters of the problem. They seem to be more infected from the adults than the other way around. And therefore, the studies in them will depend on a number of things that will define how they respond to the vaccine and how this vaccine should be used in those ages. So for now, the only thing that we can recommend is that people from 18 years and above be using, uh, be vaccinated with this Moderna vaccine. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Here's the next question coming from Kaylin Song, also watching us on Facebook. COVID is COVID vaccination safe for breastfeeding mommies? So maybe I can take that one. Um, Dr. Carvioto um, uh, spoke a little bit about the recommendations from SAGE around um, whether or not moms who are breastfeeding um, can receive the vaccine. So the first thing to say is um, there's nothing about the vaccine that we think is problematic for people who are breastfeeding. Um, but we don't actually have um, specific evidence from women who are breastfeeding who received the vaccine and then were followed over time to, to find out if there's any, any problem. So just to be really clear, there's, we, don't, we have no reason to believe that there's any problem, um, but we, we don't actually have that. I can't point you to that evidence right now. So the recommendations from SAGE um, really emphasize for women who are breastfeeding that you can get vaccinated, um, but we're prioritizing um, those women who are in the high risk groups. So if you're a breastfeeding woman and there's no other reason why you should be vaccinated um, at this point, given the shortage of vaccine, it's really about women who are in high risk groups who can go ahead and get vaccinated even if they're breastfeeding. There will be information that will be collected um, as more and more women do get vaccinated and, and women, including women who are breastfeeding. So we'll have more evidence around which to make a, a more positive statement about um, specific evidence in breastfeeding. But if you're in a high risk group and you're supposed to get vaccinated now and you're breastfeeding, go ahead and get vaccinated. There's no reason to get vaccinated just because you're breastfeeding. That doesn't put you into a high risk group. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much, Kate. And here's the next question. What is the SAGE recommendation for the use of Moderna vaccines for pregnant women? Also, also an important question, and, um, and maybe I can take that one too. Again, uh, Dr. Ricarvioto went over this at the beginning of the Facebook Live, and I really want to re-emphasize it. It's very similar um, to what I just said about um, women who are breastfeeding. We have no reason to believe that this vaccine, nor the Pfizer vaccine for which we've already given recommendations, we have no reason to believe that this, there will be any problem in women who are pregnant. So if you are a pregnant woman and you are in a high risk group for whom the vaccine is recommended now, if you're a healthcare worker, if you have an underlying medical condition for which the vaccine is recommended, we do say that you should have a discussion with your provider weigh the risks and benefits so that you, in, in particular, talking about what your exposure is. And if, um, if you're in one of those high risk groups, you can go ahead and get vaccinated. What we were unable to do is to give an, a broad, sweeping, unconstrained recommendation for pregnant women because, again, we don't have the evidence from the clinical trials of women who were pregnant and who were followed over time. 
those studies are being done now. And what they're, they're being done among women who um, are pregnant and who are getting vaccinated and then following up over time to, um, to document um, their own health, the health of their babies. So we do expect that in a, a short period of time, we will have more clear evidence in which to um, make a, a broader statement about pregnant women. But this is really about recognizing that if you are at, in a high risk group, um, you can discuss that with your provider. Um, and, and again, just discussing the, the possibility of an unknown risk um, from the vaccine. Again, we don't expect that there's any problem um, against your known risk of, of COVID. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, we're receiving a lot of questions about any side effects, short term or long term, after receiving Moderna vaccine. So do you have any data from the trials that you reviewed? I don't know, do you want to take that one? Most of the, uh, of the side effects uh, after the administration of the vaccine were relatively mild. Um, and they include pain in the arm, uh, a bit of fever sometimes, uh, people who don't feel very well in the next 24 hours, um, but nothing that could really show that the vaccine had any other big, longer side effect. In the, in the more uh, difficult, uh, uh, the more, uh, I would say the more important part, uh, there are uh, a number of allergic reactions that have been shown after the administration of the vaccine. And interestingly enough, the report coming out from CDC about uh, the numbers of, of allergic reactions to the Moderna vaccine in a country that is using it extensively, which is only the United States, have shown that it is much lower than the one that was found for the Pfizer vaccine. Instead of 11.1 .1 per million doses, this goes to about 2.3 per million doses. So it seems that to be less reactogenic. And as we have said for the other vaccine, we do not see any reason not to vaccinate anybody who has had or who has a problem or an allergic problem unless that has been to a vaccine beforehand. If somebody has had an allergic reaction when they have been vaccinated before, they shouldn't use this vaccine either. And in the other sense, if you have an allergy to dust, uh, to some kind of food, to peanuts, to other allergies, or to some of the uh, drugs, uh, sulfur, penicillin, etc., there's no reason for you not to receive this vaccine. Um, I think that those are the main effects. The other one that has been seen is this uh, problem in which half of your face gets paralyzed, what we call Bell's paralysis. There have been a few cases, but they have been evenly distributed among the people who received the vaccine and the people who received what we call the placebo, which means the non-vaccine control group in that sense. Um, as far as I remember, those were the, the only ones that I, I can recall. I don't know, Kate, if you, if you have any other ones. No, those are the main ones, and I want to emphasize the Bell's palsy that uh, Dr. Craviotto is speaking about. First of all, it's a rare condition, and secondly, it's a reversible condition. Um, and uh, it does occur um, uh, after viral infections. Um, and so, again, uh, I think what he's speaking about is um, a, a signal in the, in the safety data that we're watching carefully. At this point, there's the evidence does not support uh, that it's related to the vaccine, but we're watching this one carefully. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of our viewers, I've, I've seen the, the question coming in repeatedly. Do we know for how long the protection after receiving Moderna vaccine will last? And there, there was a question as well, whether it will be longer than natural, natural protection for people who already had COVID. Right, so that's again, a great question. So again, I'll just remind everybody that we've only had this infection and this disease around um, for just a little bit over a year. Um, and we've had the vaccines um, being used in, in first in clinical trials, um, which have been completed for many of the, um, for some of the vaccines. Um, so we don't have the answer either to how long will natural infection um, protect against a new infection, nor do we have the answer to how long the vaccines will protect. And of course, that's logical. How would we know that um, uh, unless we are actually following people over time? 
So that's the kind of information that is going to continue to come, come through as we continue to follow people over time who were in the clinical trials and the studies that are following people who have previously been infected to find out whether or not they um, get infected again. At this point, um, the, the follow-up of the evidence from the clinical trials that was presented both for a regulatory reason and for a policy reason is where um, half of the subjects had completed at least um, 60 days of follow-up. And so we, it's the evidence we have is really at this point about the short-term protection of these vaccines, um, which is very high protection. Um, and we are continuing to learn as these vaccines are um, both being rolled out in the general population, the high-risk general population, and as the people who were in the clinical trials continue to be followed because they were the first ones who had the opportunity to get the vaccines. So we expect that there will be, given the, um, given the, the antibodies that are produced by your immune system in response to the vaccine, um, those antibodies um, are sticking around. Um, they're, they're still present uh, after um, months. And so again, we'll, we'll continue to follow um, and find out together whether or not additional booster doses are needed or not. Thank you so and, much, and, Kate. Please, Alejandro, well, go ahead, sorry. And one thing, Kate, that we might add here is that the other thing we do not know is whether if you have been infected or you have been vaccinated, the virus can come again, grow in your nose or your throat and being transmitted to somebody else. This is something that we're just starting to study in the sense of having enough people vaccinated and followed up in that sense to be able to see if that reduces transmission. And this is very important because of if the variants that we're seeing really have a higher capacity to do exactly that, to go from one person to another more quickly than the original virus, uh, then these vaccines will have to really show that they work on that way in that sense. So those are ongoing studies that will allow us then to have the information necessary to see whether the vaccine has an impact not only on death or severe disease, but also on the capacity to have the infection go from one person to another. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Actually, Mohider on LinkedIn was asking if you could clarify if those who are fully vaccinated, I assume having two doses of a vaccine, could effectively become a symptomatic, a symptomatic carrier um, if they were reinfected. Yeah. That is, uh, go ahead, Kate, yes. Um, so, so that's a really important question. Um, what we really want these vaccines to do is to protect against disease. We want to protect people from getting seriously ill. We want to protect people from dying from COVID, which is what's put us all in this situation in the first place, the severity of disease. But um, really what we want is to have protection against either getting infected or even if we are infected from transmitting it to somebody else. Um, because for any vaccine, 100% of the population is either not able to get vaccinated or there's not enough supply. And so we want everybody to be protected. Um, and that's really about transmission. We don't know from the clinical trials um, whether or not these vaccines um, protect against infection in addition to protecting you against that infection causing disease. They're, the trials were designed in a way so that there is information that will be coming, um, coming out um, on that particular question. We have some early evidence that there is some protection of these vaccines against getting infected. Um, but compared with, if we use all the other vaccines we use, um, they do protect against disease. And when they protect against infection, it's usually in a way that is not as strong as the protection against disease. So we expect that these vaccines will protect against infection, but probably not to the magnitude, to the intensity that they protect against disease. And that reason that's super important is even if you're vaccinated now, you need to keep wearing your mask. You need to keep the hand washing going, physical distancing, not, not aggregating in crowds, because there are so few people who are vaccinated at this point, number one, and number two, even if you're vaccinated, the chance that you could be infected and not know it is still there. 
and that you could transmit it to somebody else. So again, we're in the early days of understanding how these vaccines are, wh whether or not the vaccines protect against infection and transmission and to what degree. So while we're in this early phase, um, it's extremely important to continue um, all of the interventions that we have in the toolbox while the vaccines are rolling out. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, here is a follow-up question from, from the first overview that Alejandro gave us, and you mentioned international tra travelers. So here is the question. Can you please clarify, are you saying that international travelers should wait until they get back to their base to get vaccinated? No, what we're saying is that if you're going to travel internationally, that means that you're going to go to, from your home to somewhere else that is outside your country, uh, in which some for some diseases, for a long time, for smallpox, nowadays if you're going to Africa or to South America, you need to have proof that you have been vaccinated against yellow fever. Uh, because you don't want to be infected when you travel to those places. That is something that we're still not recommending for traveling outside your country in the sense of needing to be vaccinated to be able to get on a plane to go somewhere else. What countries are requiring now is to prove that you don't have the virus in your nose or your throat in the 72, 48 hours before you travel. And that's a country decision in the sense that uh, supposedly makes people who are infected not travel from one place to another. Um, but that as, as the, the idea that you have to arrive somewhere and quarantine for a number of days before actually going into uh, the, a regular type of life in, where you have arrived are things that the countries are deciding. But so far, the international health regulations that define this type of requirements for travel have decided that there is not enough vaccine, in, in a sense, or there is no clear indication that we would need to vaccinate travelers for now to be able to, do, to travel from one country to another. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Kate, do you have anything to add? Yeah, it's just, I think it's the distinction between whether there's a whether there's a rule or you know a regulation around a requirement to be vaccinated in order to travel internationally, um, as opposed to um, what the what the benefit of vaccination is for you, whether you're traveling or not. So I think the clarification that we're making is there is no requirement for vaccination in order to travel internationally, and these kinds of decisions are governed by a set of regulations that, um, that WHO convenes, and they're called the International Health Regulations. There is only one vaccine, as Alejandro said, the yellow fever vaccine, for which there is an agreement among countries about the requirement for vaccination for travel internationally. There is a discussion going on about would the COVID vaccine ever become a vaccine that would be a requirement in order to travel across a border. And uh, the committee, the external expert committee that provides advice to WHO on this met recently, and they were very clear that the conditions um, that, would, um, that, would, that, would, that would need to be met in order to make that kind of recommendation have not been met. And so there is, um, at this time, they are not recommending uh, for there to be a requirement of vaccination in order to travel internationally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, here's the next question. If you receive the vaccine and a few days later you developed COVID, when should you get the second dose after you recovered and how long after? If yes. That, that's a very interesting question because if you have had your first dose, and then you develop a disease, supposedly from what we have seen, you would have enough immunity produced. I mean, your body would have reacted to the virus to produce defenses in enough quantity for you not to need anything else. Um, so in that sense, if you have had a dose and then you become sick, we don't recommend that you get any other doses of vaccine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Kate, do you have anything to add? 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the, this is a, a little bit of a, a gray zone area, especially in a setting where we have vaccine shortage. Um, there is, uh, there's no specific situation where we have said, you know, get one dose and not the second dose. Um, we've talked about um, people who have had disease before um, and whether or not they can delay getting even the first dose, um, because we do know that when you have disease, you do develop immunity. And that immunity does seem, at this point from the data, seem to be durable for at least six months. So we did say in the recommendations that um, an individual um, out of their own goodwill could decide to, um, to defer, to, to wait to get their vaccination if they're in a group for whom vaccine is recommended already and vaccine is in short supply. If they've already had disease, um, they might say, you know, I'll, I'll step back in the line and let somebody go before me um, because I know I have a period of time um, while the vaccine supply is increasing, there's a period of time where I, I am likely to be immune because I've already had COVID disease. So this is sort of a nuance on that, on that scenario. If you've already gotten the first dose, um, could you delay getting the second dose? And, and uh, I think that we didn't make a specific recommendation around that situation, but I think the logical answer is you, you could delay your second dose. Um, again, sort of volunteering to step back in the line and let somebody else go go first but but what what i should make clear alexa sorry is that no, no, please. that there's there's no reason for you not to get a second dose even if you have been infected and you had had your first dose before the infection Thank you. Thank you so much for answering this. Uh, Kate, I think this would be a great question for you. Andreas watching us on, on Facebook is asking, how is WHO helping low-income countries to get vaccinated? Yes, I, as again, I think all of our Facebook um, folks out there know um, these vaccines are really important and they're in short supply. Um, and what's extremely important is that no country is going to be safe unless all countries are getting vaccinated. And the reason is that these germs don't recognize borders. They're going to move across borders, as we've seen, uh, even with um, the reduction and, and uh, limitation of travel. Um, and this is a pandemic. So every country uh, needs access to these vaccines. And it needs to be done in an equitable and fair way. It's, not, it's, not, it's neither fair, nor is it smart from a science, health, and epidemiology perspective for a group of countries, high-income countries to go first, and low and low-middle-income countries to um, come much later. Um, that, that, that doesn't make either scientific sense, it doesn't make economic sense, and it certainly doesn't make um, ethical or moral sense. Um, the way that we're um, assuring that countries, regardless of the ability to pay, have access to vaccines is that we have what's called a global facility. It's called the COVAX facility. It stands for COVID vaccine. It's, um, it's, uh, uh, it's led by um, the Gavi Alliance in partnership with WHO and with CEPI, who develops research and development on vaccines. And this is um, a facility that has done deals with a variety of manufacturers to get now over 2 billion doses of vaccine available to countries just in 2021. And there are 191 countries or economies that have joined the COVAX facility. It represents over 90% of the world's population. And so each of these countries um, can access vaccines through the COVAX facility. For 92 countries that would have difficulty paying for the vaccines on their own, those vaccines come for free to the country for the first 20% of the population of the country. Enough doses to cover in two dose regimens, at least 20%. We actually think we have enough doses to cover probably something up to about 27 or 28% of the, the population of those 92 countries. We are just about to launch uh, the first doses out of that facility in, in the coming weeks. Um, and starting to distribute the, the vaccines that are available. The vaccines are in short supply in every country around the world. You're hearing in the news about countries fighting over vaccines. So I, I do want people to remember, we all are in this together. This is going to take time to get enough vaccine to enough countries, to enough people to really end this pandemic. But we, this is the light at the end of the tunnel. 
And what we need to really double down on now is all of the other tools that we have so that the transmission is as low as possible while we're rolling out vaccines. Um, this is not the time to stop using the interventions that are, are right in front of us and that we are all using our masks, hand washing, um, physical distancing, limiting being in, in large groups. Thank you so much, Kate. Here is another question that comes to, to um, supply chain. Um, does Moderna vaccine also uh, requires super cold chain? Um, and what are we doing to support countries on logistics? Uh, no, the, the benefit of the Moderna vaccine being an mRNA vaccine is that it only requires normal refrigeration. That means to be kept between two and eight deg uh, degrees. And, and that's a big benefit. The other benefit it has is that it already comes diluted in the vials, in 10 dose vials. So you can actually just take it out and use it instead of needing to put a diluent in and then and, uh, use it in that sense. So uh, in that it has a, a benefit, especially for countries that would need a huge investment in cold chain to be able to handle the one that um, goes down to minus 70 degrees. Um, in 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 uh, what was the other question that they had? Uh, the, the other question was how how is WHO supporting countries on on logistics and the um, distribution of vaccines? That's for Kate. Yeah, let me take that one. So um, as Alejandro said, so uh, you know there there is there are two vaccines that WHO has made recommendations on now for use: the Pfizer vaccine, which does require. Um, this ultra cold chain being kept at minus 60 to minus 90 degree temperatures. And that's pretty tough for countries to do because the immunization system doesn't have another vaccine like that um, in routine use. And so we don't have um, routinely in clinics and hospitals and uh, outreach clinics, these minus 70 freezers. The Moderna vaccine, as, as uh, Dr. Cravioto said, um, is, uh, does not require that ultra cold chain. It's for long-term storage, it's kept at a usual freezer temperature at minus 20, that's a usual freezer temperature. And then it can be taken out of that um, for a, a period of weeks, um, kept at refrigeration temperature. So it makes it easier to deliver. But regardless of that, and some of the other vaccines that are coming down the, the pipeline um, don't even need to be kept frozen. They can be kept at refrigeration temperatures. So again, that would make things easier. Um, but regardless of that, um, we're trying to put, as a world, billions of doses um, through a system um, that, uh, that suddenly needs to absorb those billions of doses. And so countries are being supported for those that would have difficulty expanding the number of refrigerators and freezers that they have. Um, there is financial support through Gavi um, to expand the cold chain, to buy more freezers, to buy more refrigerators, and to put them in places in clinics and hospitals and outreach centers um, around the country to uh, absorb the volume of vaccines that will be coming through. On the Pfizer vaccine, I did talk about this ultra cold chain, but Pfizer has made special shipping boxes that are designed specifically for their vaccine. And as long as you can refill those shipping boxes with dry ice, those shipping boxes, in fact, can be used to store the vaccine for um, up to approximately a month. Um, and then the vaccine can be taken out of that ultra cold chain and kept for about five days in the refrigerator. So there, we're working to figure out all the systems um, so that these vaccines can get to everybody everywhere that needs them. But Alexa, the main thing with the vaccines is not how they're transported, it's how they get into the arms of people. And here, many countries, unfortunately, haven't had real programs to vaccinate people um, in the elderly group. Uh, usually, um, uh, people uh, who get vaccinated are small infants or uh, young children, adolescents against uh, human papilloma virus, uh, for example. So in many cases where there's no real uh, program, for example, to vaccinate the elderly against influenza, the countries will need to find a way 
to create a program to address the vaccination of these groups, to find the people where they're living, or to be able to have access to them. And that's something that WHO has already been working on very acutely also, to help countries develop a program in which the age group now has to be extended to be able to vaccinate groups that normally have not been part of the immunization process. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. Um, we were watched by viewers all around the world. Myanmar, Canada, Sudan, the US, Austria, Rwanda, Lesotho, Pakistan, Sierra Leone, Botswana, Germany, Haiti, Uruguay, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Argentina, Brazil, Nepal, France, and, and many others. Um, I thank you both for, for your time to answer their questions. I'm sure we'll be receiving more and more, so that we'll need your time again, as, as many people are interested in all the information and news that we have around COVID vaccines and how they can, they can get them. So I think at this moment, um, the priority are health workers, older people, and other, other people at risk and, and our director general has called on the world and countries to prioritize all health workers and people at risk, highest risk to be vaccinated in first hundred days. So we hope that, that countries and, and every individual will follow the call and that we will, we will work together towards vaccine equity as, as, as we are calling on. Um, do you have any, any final comments before we close today? I just um, really want to uh, encourage everybody. This has been a heck of a year um, and everybody is tired. Everybody is really fed up with the, the change in our lives and everybody wants, uh, me included, to get back to a new normal life. Um, and uh, we it's so important now um, that we not lose our resolve that we not lose our, uh, our willingness to do the things that we need to do to keep ourselves safe, to keep our families safe, and to keep people in our community safe who we don't even know. Um, and because it's so important that each of us can take action, each of us can do something in our daily lives to make sure that we're protecting others around us, some of whom we don't even know who they are, um, and we're protecting ourselves. The vaccines are here, um, but they are going to take time to get out to everybody. So um, what we want to do is minimize and just really stop the deaths that are happening now while we've got these vaccines right on the horizon. So really encouraging everybody, get your mask on, um, spend time at home, uh, take care of yourselves, take care of your loved ones, um, wash your hands, please don't go into big groups, um, really limit your exposure. The vaccines are coming. We've got to keep using all the tools that we have, and we will get out of this together as long as we're all committed to that. Thanks. That's Thank what I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Kate. Dr. Alejandro, any final word from you? I think that that was the best message. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. And until next time, please, everyone, stay safe and follow the advice that Kate just summarized greatly.